to the Loins of History. I'm Colin, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jay. And we've got an exciting new series that we're going to start on the history of U.S. and Chinese relations. I'm really excited about this series, Jay, because I think this is going to be... It, it, no, as a matter of fact, it is one of the most important geopolitical dynamics going on right now. Um, unless you've lived under a rock, you know that the Chinese and the U.S. have been somewhat confrontational recently under the Trump administration. We had um, new negotiations on trade rights. Right now, the Biden administration is kind of in a battle about the semiconductors and production of semiconductors, which if you remember back to our last episode, fueled the digital age and a lot of economic growth. So it's a really big deal, not just for the growth of the economy, but to maintain these digital tools in which we rely on now. With this dynamic, it's something that's going to be important for the next 100 years. The Chinese have a vision for the future and that vision has them as number one. They will be they want to be the global hegemon. And what we want to do on this podcast is give some historical context behind that. We are not necessarily going to dive into the absolute 5000 year history of China into great detail. We're not going to be studying the the Shang dynasty and their Lakes of Wine, it's fascinating, but that's not what this podcast wants to do. We want to help you understand what is happening now through the past because the past has been settled and it's something that we can look back to to study and it's really going to give us the context to understand why the Chinese are acting the way they are now and what they're going to do in the future. That's right. Yeah. So just to kind of reiterate exactly what kind of podcast we are there's really good history podcasts out there that are way better at doing the technical history than we are. <laughs> uh, we, Colin and I, are amateur historians, right? Uh, we do not, we don't do this for a living. But we do it for the love of history. But we do it. For, we do it for the love of the game. <laughs> <laughs> like we believe history as a discipline, does itself a disservice by not trying to apply itself to today. In fact, I would argue that the the main reason why history exists as a discipline is so that we as human beings can better understand today. And it always boggles my mind when people, you know, in the in the professional history industry don't want to talk about it. Like they kind of stop the history 50 years ago and go, eh, it's too controversial at this point. And I would argue one reason why we can't have good discussions in our society, at least in the US today, is because we don't know our history. Like we don't know the background from where we came from. And we chose China and US relations for our next one because like like Colin said, this is this issue's not going away. This isn't like, oh, we beat the we beat the Nazis in in four to six years, depending on who you are, uh, and it's over, and we don't have to worry about them anymore. Like that's not happening uh, between the U.S. and China. I I would argue we don't want that to happen. <laughs> no, our, our fates are so intertwined. Um, it would cause a significant disruption to the the world order if. Uh, if one of us was to go away suddenly or to lose, right. so to speak. Right. The, uh, I, I think one, one helpful way of thinking about this is we, the U.S. and China should think of one another in the same way that the British and the French did for like a thousand years. We should think of the Pacific Ocean as the English Channel. I know that's crazy to say because those are obviously like two very different size uh, bodies of water. <laughs> but the United States has significant interests in the Asian mainland in the same way that the British, they were not continental Europe, but the British for a thousand years were in competition with the French because of their interests on the European continent. In the same way, the United States, yes, there's a very large body of water in between our two continents. However, you know, due to technology, due to information, due to all kinds of things that we're going to talk about here uh, as this series goes along, the United States is not leaving Asia from an involvement aspect, no more than the Brits are going to no longer be involved in continental Europe. <laughs> and w- 
to my knowledge, we don't have any listeners in China. Uh, I, I don't know how VPNs work. Uh, if they're listening to us through a VPN, it'll probably, you know, our analytics will say the country that the VPN is from, not China per se. But, you know, it China needs to understand that the United States is not going to just give up on Asia. That's not going to happen. From a business standpoint, the hottest market in the world today is Asia. Uh, and China is a huge part of that. So like even from a business standpoint, American businesses are going to continually try to break into the the Asian market. Uh, and we will we will always be involved. So this is not we have to understand our history between our two countries, between our two cultures, between our two peoples, if we're going to compete well, if we want to avoid destructive conflict, you know, where thousands, if not millions of people die. It's happened before. It'll probably happen again. I hope not. But like, if we want to avoid that, we probably should understand where each side's coming from and how we can better work with one another in the future. That's why we're doing this series, people. <laughs> That's great, Jay. And I, so I think we've got it. I think we've got our listeners, the, the framing for the next series. So can you, let's talk specifically about this episode. So what are the, the key takeaways that we want to take from just this introductory episode? Yeah, absolutely. So for this this episode in particular, we just want to lay the, the context of the beginning of formal relations between China and the US. Uh, and, the, and the main context is that China is beginning it's century of humiliation. So we're talking the 1840s. So we're going we're gonna to talk about the treaties. We're going to talk about the first opium war. But the key takeaway is that the initiation of formal relations between the US and China was the Qing dynasty is in the beginning of its decline. And the US just shows up going, hey, and <laughs> things are not good for China. <laughs> Things no, are about to get much, much worse. That's an interesting point. Like in the 1840s, it was kind of this, the Qing dynasty was on its way down. We're starting the century of humiliation and it's it's a very tough hundred years for the Chinese people. But you know, on the other side, it's the US, which is this emerging power. We've mm -hmm. just- Run up and up. What, yeah, just what, 70 years before we declared independence, we fought for that independence from the British twice. Um, so we are on the up and up. We're kind of coming out of that first industrial revolution. We have the Civil War, but we are a rising power on the world scene. And um, when we show up, we we kind of start making demands like we are world power. So can you can you tell us about the, how we formalized those first trade agreements and opened up formal negotiations? Yeah. So to begin the story <laughs> of U.S. and China, we have what's called the the Treaty of Wangxia and Disclaimer: There's going to be a lot of really bad pronunciations. <laughs> I'm glad you. Brought, I'm glad you brought like, that up. I'm because... <laughs> really sorry, folks. I'm really sorry. Uh, I do not speak Mandarin. Uh, Colin, you don't 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 shock me right now. You don't speak Mandarin, do you? <laughs> no, unfortunately, not. <laughs> yeah, like I don't speak Mandarin. Really sorry. Gonna pr mispronounce some stuff, but I promise that the. The good intentions and, and effort will be there. So I'll try and learn it by the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in 1844, 1844, the United States and the Qing Dynasty signed what's called the Treaty of Wangxia. This treaty is what began formal relations. It was the first like formal treaty signed between the Chinese and the Americans. Prior to this treaty, we we, the United States, we knew about China, right? And China knew about us, but, and there had been some trade, like prior to this point, uh, there's, you know, you can read about Americans were actually importing opium into China from Turkey. There was, so like there was a trade, albeit a bad one, uh, that had kind of already been established, but between our governments, there was no formal thing. So this Treaty of Wangsha is what began formal relations between uh, the U.S. and China. But to kind of understand what's going on in 1844, you have to understand the First Opium War. Uh, the First Opium War 
took place between the British and the Qing dynasty from 1839 to 1842. And from the Chinese viewpoint, 1839 is what began the century of humiliation. Long story short, uh, I'm, sh- I'm sure we've all, you know, us Americans can probably recall vaguely hearing about the Opium Wars uh, in our history textbooks. Mm-hmm. Um, Europeans, I'm kind of interested on on what uh, our European listeners' perspective is because, you know, obviously well, they the made British, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, like they were the ones actually engaging in the conflict. So I'm curious what their history books have taught them. Uh, but the Opium War was essentially the British East India Company was growing and producing opium, which had you know in the 1830s, 1840s had just been had was a very addictive recreational drug. Well, did, weren't they using it for like medicinal purposes? Yeah. It, yeah. But it was it was low use, you know, kind of like fentanyl now. It technically has some medical uses, but if it's abused, it can be very addictive. So, yes, it had it it began as medicine, but at some point recently, like recently to the 1830s and 40s, it had it had produced a smoking variant and this smoking variant was used for recreational use in China. And mm. it was huge. Like demand for opium by Chinese uh, people was was huge. And the, and the British East India Company was more than happy to make this opium in India, ship it over to China to this huge market. I think at this time in China, there were around 400 million people living in China, mm-hmm. which – is around the same population as the United States today. It's bigger. It's 70 million people bigger. That's a lot. Yeah. So that's more people than what live in the United States today, right? And we, oh, by the way, are the third most populous country in the world behind China and India. So uh, that's a lot of people. That's a huge market. So if you can sell your product to, in, in, which in this case is opium, if you can sell it to them, you can make a lot of money. Well, of course, this drug uh, is not one to make someone productive in society, mm. right? It's extremely addictive. It ruins your livelihood because all you want to do is smoke opium. So various emperors, Qing dynasty emperors had banned opium, but they were having a very difficult time enforcing this rule. Well, in 1939, the, uh, the emperor- Sorry, 1839, the emperor, the Chinese emperor, appointed a governor general, Lin Zhezhu. <laughs> no, he's not French. I just can't pronounce it. <laughs> Z-E-X-U. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, folks. Um, he appointed this guy, uh, General Lin, to basically get rid of opium. And long story short, down in Canton, which is in southern China, uh, he seized around 1,300 tons, metric tons of opium that had belonged to the British. Well, there was this big standoff. And long story short, like he made the British pay him somehow. uh, And then he ended up just destroying a ton of opium. Um, Well, the Brits found out about it. They got really mad and they said, we're going to make the Chinese pay us for all that opium. So the British did the most, you know, British thing possible. Tally ho, mates. They sail their ships. <laughs> they sail their they Royal the Navy ship. Navy. Yep. They sail their ships uh, into uh, Macau, which uh, is near Macau and Hong Kong. So still Southern China. If you love to <laughs> gamble, they- you know where it's at. Yeah, uh, it just obliterate the Chinese Navy. <laughs> the- it's interesting to see that the difference in what, you know, the Industrial Revolution, what it can do for military power, um, because at this point, the British were well into the Industrial Revolution and their Navy was substantially stronger and more advanced. Uh, obviously, right. Britain was probably a fraction of the size of the China, of China, and this is only a piece of their navy that went over there and just wiped out the. Because I think the Chinese ships at this point were basically like wooden ships. I think they called them junks, and just 
absolutely had no chance against the British Navy. Yeah, it was no contest. And when the when this outside threat, the Qing dynasty was more or less powerless to kind of not do anything. China's a very poor country at this point. You know, they had not really had much of an industrial revolution. And there were a, there's a lot of internal dissent and you know, if you know anything about Chinese history, there's these waves of you know, famine and drought and um, poor living conditions. And the Chinese, like, you know, these warlords would come around and they would threaten the stability and they would threaten the mandate of heaven. So the Qing, when the British came in, the Qing just kind of wanted them off their back. So in, uh, so this all happened in 1840, the British, uh, ship sailing in 1840, destroy the Chinese uh, defenses. So in 1842, they negotiate this uh, this treaty called the Treaty of Nanjing. And this was the first unequal treaty, uh, one of the major ones uh, between the British and uh, the Chinese. And this treaty did a few different things. First first of all, it, it ceded the uh it ceded what we now know as hong kong to the brits um if you if you've seen in the news recently the chinese have actually started teaching in their textbooks that hong kong was never a part of uh great britain uh which is which is interesting because ag- again thinking about this in context of the century of humiliation they are trying to whitewash this uh like that's how bad it is. It's like completely. It's so. It's like the equivalent to us. Like, oh, the s- slavery never. T- we were never slaves. Like that never happened. Like, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> no. It's like no. It did. Uh, yeah. So the Treaty of Nanjing it ceded Hong Kong. Um, it also created five treaty ports, which this is this is big because this is when the United States kind of goes. Wait a minute. Um, it created five treaty ports. Uh, Shanghai. Canton, Ningbo, Fuzhou, uh, and Xiamen, which a lot of these were kind of in the south and central east coast of of China. Um, And uh, I actually think Fuzhou was called (laughs) Fuchu at the time. And uh, I think Xiamen... uh, was called uh, Amoy or something like that. So some of these in Ningbo was called Dingpo. <laughs> we were we were still learning at, at that point in time. But anyway, there were these five treaty ports. And what these treaty ports essentially like were, were they were designated areas where Western powers, and at this point British, could actually like buy land, establish like, you know, businesses, churches, hospitals. They would have their own districts within these cities. Yeah. Like they were, they were essentially annexing small chunks of the Chinese coast, which fast forward, um, you know, by the time of world war two, the, the British, the French, the Portuguese. And if you want to go back to world war one timeframe, the Germans all had, they owned these cities on the east coast of China. It's almost like, imagine for Americans here, it's almost like San Francisco was owned by Japan, San Diego is owned by China, Seattle is owned by Australia, like <laughs> you name it. Like these random cities on your coast are all owned by these foreign powers. That's not a good look. <laughs> no. It- that's why they call it the century of humiliation. That's right. So this is like, we shouldn't just kind of wave this off because it's like, oh, it ceded Hong Kong to Britain. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Hong Kong's British. Like, no, like it wasn't. It was China. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it did that. Um, and it forced, so the Treaty of Nanjing, it forced the Qing dynasty to pay an indemnity of, uh, in current dollars, $21 million. Um which was a huge burden for the Qing at that time. Uh, and it also allowed the opium trade to continue uh, within there. So that's that's kind of the gist of the first opium war. 
Jay, that's that's a good synopsis of the of the first opium war, and and I do just want to make a couple points as you were, were talking about that. I, I kind of want to tie this back into when we were talking about mercantilism because this opium trade started. If you think about you know mercantilism, where they they wanted to keep the goods within their own closed economy, you know, so the British, the French, they had this closed economy, and. In China, they didn't really have a demand for European goods, so they had to pay heavy amounts of silver in order to get, you know, the you know to get Chinese goods, and you know there that's money leaving this closed economy, and they didn't really like that. So this, so using opium, it's something it like you mentioned. There's a demand right there, and it's mm. something that the British could get very easily. So instead of having this money leaving their closed economy, now they could just get opium. And make money and put money, take money out of their system and put it into this closed economy of Great Britain. So it, you know, we haven't moved into pure capitalism. So this is kind of like uh, late stage mercantilism, at, you know, by the 1840s. But still, they didn't like money leaving their economy. But opium, they didn't mind because they knew it had a damaging effect on the Chinese, and it was in a massive, you know, there's a massive demand for it. And no, then the other a, point I want to make. Great point. The you know, we're talking about the century of humiliation and these ports being basically owned by other countries. This happened 180 years ago, and you know Chinese history spans almost 5,000 years. So 180 years ago, like for the Chinese looking back, like it's almost like yesterday. This is yeah. very recent, and it is still something that burnt. You know, like you just mentioned, they're they're saying Hong Kong was never part of Great Britain. If you were born in if you were born in the nineties, you know Hong Kong. Like it, the lease, the quote lease wasn't up until nineteen ninety nine. Mm-hmm. It's very recent, and they're literally trying to take this away. Um, but I, I say that to say to contrast that with Americans, and it's like as an American, we have such short memories because our country is so new. Like think back to. Pre nine eleven, it's almost like another time. It's it's almost like another epic. It's hard to yeah. think back that that hard. So comparing and contrasting the the cultures of the U.S. and the Chinese, like the Chinese are ancient, and so we have to frame this in like these things that happened one hundred eighty years ago feel like yesterday to them. Whereas for us, we're like President Tyler one hundred eighty years ago, the eighteen forties, like that. That's a lifetime ago. That's over half. You know, our country is not even three hundred years old. One hundred eighty years is over half. That's greater than half our country's time frame. So, um, yeah. I think Mike Duncan, who does the History of Rome podcast, he said it like the history, the decline of Western Rome lasted longer than the U.S. has actually been a country. Like that's how new we are in historical terms. So that's my little side tangent to say like. They have a very different mentality about these things in history than we do as Americans. Again, that's what we're trying to do with the loins of history. We're trying to explain <laughs> explain the present through the past. Yeah. No, that's good because we'll, we'll probably say this phrase lots of times. The phrase, the Chinese view of time is very different from what the Western and especially the American view of time is. And it's the long game. Uh mm-hmm. Not to get too far ahead, this is probably several episodes in the future, but one reason uh, why Chiang Kai-shek was so frustrating to Americans was he employed this concept called the strategic retreat. And it was, and it's a very Chinese thing. Like if you tell Americans that a strategic retreat is a good thing, they would probably think you're crazy. Um, but the reason why Ch- uh, Chiang Kai-shek was fond of the strategic retreat is because from his perspective, it's like, this is China. We're huge. Like, let the Japanese come in and we will swallow them whole because that's what the Chinese have done over and the Mongols, um, geez, the Huns, like you name it, these, the Japanese, the, the, Japanese, the British, like you name it, these you know, foreign external powers, China's just absorbed them. Henry Kissinger actually makes a really good point of this in his book on China, which I'm sure we'll reference again and again. But it's like Chinese culture is is really about how is it has absorbed and assimilated its conquerors. Whereas, you know, Western history, European history – you know, there's a conqueror, like, and we think of the Romans, like the Romans would intentionally assimilate its 
you know, the tribes that it conquered and make them Roman. Well, China's the opposite. It would, anytime it got conquered, the Mongols are arguably the best example of this. Anytime it was conquered by a foreign power, they're like, okay, you can be the emperor. And then over time, those, the conquerors started looking more and more Chinese. <laughs> yeah, and, they started looking, and China acting. just kind of remained the same. Yeah. And that's because to your point about time, like they have this view of time that we don't have where they play the long game and, you know, to use a biblical reference, like a a year is a thousand years and a thousand years is like a year. (laughs) And they've just been around a lot longer than us. Yeah. It's important for us to recognize that um, we need to think beyond election cycles and start thinking in spans of lifetimes and not just a lifetime of a person, but a lifetime of a country. To say all that, it's this, when we talk about the first opium war, like Americans kind of dismiss this as that wasn't us. Yeah, we know imperialism's bad, you know, blah, 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 blah. To the Chinese, it's not that simple. To Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party, it's not that simple because they see the first opium war as Western external influence in their country that began a, a 110 years to be specific decline in their country from 1839 to 1949, which 1949 is when the Chinese communist party. Yeah. Pushed all the, pushed all the, the nationalists out. Um, and when people talk about the hundred year marathon, that's 1949 to 2049, which the goal is to have a united China, cough, cough, Taiwan, um, mm-hmm. uh, and cough, cough, parts of, you know, border disputes with India as well. Um, you know, to have a whole China by that, by that point in time. So like, this isn't, this isn't just like a, the first opium war isn't an irrelevant part of history. It's like, it's scar tissue to the Chinese. So it's important for Westerners and especially Americans to understand. I mean, I can't, I, again, I go back to like in American context, like the war of 1812, the British burned down our capital. And most people don't even know that today. But if you were to go to China and say, you know, if you were to go to the Chinese communist party and be like, what do you think of the first opium war? Like I can imagine like there'd be a visceral reaction and just yeah, totally probably disdain get punched in the it. face. Yeah. Th- you just might, <laughs> or they play the long game and not, I don't know what they would do there, but you know, just have you arrested uh, more than likely yeah. if you did it in China. But um, yeah, it's, it's very important. And so let's, let's bring it back to the episode here. Yeah. So the you know, first opium war ends, um, they set up these unequal treaties, but what's the treaty that they signed with the U S can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that? Yeah, so going back to the Treaty of Wangsha here. Um, so 1842 was the Treaty of Nanjing, ended the First Opium War, and it opened up Chinese markets to the British. Well, essentially, after that point in time, there was a scramble by everyone. The French um, and I think the Germans, but definitely the French, uh, they also signed treaties with the Chinese. They're like, well, we want to trade with your country too. And the Americans, we did the exact same thing. So the Tyler administration uh, sent uh, sent some diplomats, a guy named uh, Chester, I believe. Um, I have to double check that. But uh, we sent some diplomats over to China and we were like, yo, we want access to your country too. And we showed up with warships. We didn't actually engage anybody. Like the the Qing at this point in time were probably just rolling their eyes, going, "Deck, come it, <laughs> they come again." Yeah, they did. There, here we got more. We got more white devils over here trying to come in our country. Uh, and on, from the American perspective, it worked. So they signed they signed this treaty for us uh, in this in this temple. And this treaty did a few different things. It granted uh, the U.S. most favored nation status, which is an interesting title because there's multiple most favored nations. Uh, All most most favored nation status, all that means is that we're going to grant you equal trading status as these other countries. So don't be misled by the word most. Think of it as just a favored nation, and you are equally favored as all the other most favored nations. <laughs> so it granted ac- you know, U.S. access to Chinese markets. Uh, 
it set fixed tariff prices in the five uh, treaty ports. It allowed um, U.S. missionaries and businesses to buy land in these uh, in these treaty ports, to where we were going. You know, we established churches, we established hospitals, we established. Um, uh, businesses. It allowed uh, Americans to learn the Chinese language. At this point in time, uh, there, it was illegal for foreigners to actually learn uh, uh, the different languages, which at this point in time, there were several different dialects, but there's just kind of like this blanket, you can't learn our language type deal. Uh, and this treaty like got rid of that. Essentially, this treaty, it was, it was basically the Americans going, oh, we want to have similar stuff to, um, to what the British and the French and some other folks had. So I bring all that up to say the beginning. So starting the, the story between the U.S. and China at the beginning here, it's not on a good note from the Chinese perspective. I'm sure from the American perspective is like, it's great. We're going to, we're going to give them, you know, all kinds of good stuff. We're going to help gonna heal the money. sick. We're going to give them the we're gospel. Money. Yeah, we're going to make all kinds of money. It's going to be fantastic. Um, blah, 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 blah. But again, from the Chinese perspective, this is not good. <laughs> and, and, I, and I really want to beat this dead horse because from a, from a tone perspective for the rest of our series, it is not like China henceforth – their posture is not this like capitalistic free trade, which to be fair to Americans, like I don't, I don't want to bash the Americans were not coming at this from the same angle as the British. The British have a huge growing empire in India, in Africa. Uh, they still have a uh, Canada, uh, as part, you know, in the Hudson Bay colony, like, British the imperialism sun never set on the British empire on the British empire. They are reaching their zenith. They're they're rapidly approaching it. Right. Um, yeah. Victorian era Britain is like that's the that's the pinnacle. Um, heck, even even from the Qing Dynasty standpoint, the largest Chinese empire of all time was the Qing Dynasty, and it reached its largest you know geographical point. Uh, in 1760, and it included modern day uh, Manchuria, Tibet, Mongolia, and a lot of other uh, places um, on the west, kind of out near the Gobi Desert that's not necessarily included today. Um, it was in Taiwan. It included Taiwan, folks. Um, like in 1760, the Qing dynasty was huge. It was larger than what... Uh, uh, communist China is today. Uh, so like imperialism is, is in full swing. The United States has never had quite the same perspective on imperialism. We've always had a, uh, a mercantile approach to quote unquote American imperialism. Yes, we had colonies. Yes, there was the Philippines, but like the U S was never necessarily trying to like annex parts of China, whereas European powers were and did. But from the Chinese perspective, it's difficult. It, like the Chinese are not going to like give the Americans the benefit of the doubt and, and understand <laughs> like, like, Oh, the Americans, they're actually just really good people. You I know, they just kind of want money. No, I kind of have this vision of like, this man just got beat up and mugged. And then like, we come up to him and we're like, Hey, dude, can I have your shoes? And we're like, I'll give you a dollar. <laughs> like, I'll give you a dollar for your shoes. You and it, like this dude, I'm just not going to hit you a bloody face. I'm not, Hey, I'm not going to hit you. I, I'm not, I don't come violently. I'll pay you for him. Here's a dollar. And it's just yeah. like, well, what's the guy going to do? Say no. And he, you speak the same language. You look the same. You as literally the exact, were part as of the, the dude same who empires. literally just beat you, yeah, to a pulp. Yeah, they're not yeah, going to they look at you difference. and go like, mm, you, you don't have the same accent. You must be a good guy. Like that's not what's going through their head. <laughs> yeah, they're just laying there with a bloody nose. Like, oh, great, great. Yeah, Here, here's some. No, more that's gum. that is a that is a fantastic analogy. Um, that that's the context of the beginning 
of um, U.S. and Chinese relations. Really, I really wanted to spend a, a lot of time this episode just kind of laying the foundation without going too far into the history itself. You know, we, we talked about the 1830s and 40s. That's a fairly narrow uh, point in time. But because the beginning um, was so controversial and so bad, it really sets the tone for the entire rest of the series, for the whole of American Chinese relations, we've never been on that good of a page. And when we think about what competition and what relations look like between our two nations for the next hundreds of years, we have to understand that the good times were the exception. The norm has always been bad times, bad relations between uh, between our two countries. Uh, so in our, in our next episode, we're going to talk about the beginning of like Western and U S military involvement. We're going to talk about the Taiping rebellion. We may or may not talk about the boxer rebellion. Uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to continue to tell the story of the decline of the Qing dynasty and the rise of Western and American intervention. Uh, and we're also going to talk about Japan because Japan plays a huge role in, uh, not not mediating, but you know, Japan as a as a growing nation, the Americans were kind of like, wait a minute, should we be more afraid of the Chinese? Should we be more afraid of the Japanese? Should we try to play these two countries off of uh, one another? And then after World War II, this flip flops. I can't wait to <laughs> I can't wait to talk about that. But, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where this series is going. So. Uh, hope hope y'all hope y'all enjoy that, and I think Colin's gonna close us out here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I am. No, I... <laughs> you beat me to it, yeah. Jay. Thanks for that, and yeah, I mean this is a, this is going to be a very exciting series. You know, we we laid the groundwork here. It, it's interesting to see that you know we got off on the wrong foot, and and basically a conflict and we have never resettled. Like it has always been a point. It's always come from a point of contention. I feel like that's where most of our relations, most of these agreements, most of, of where we're seeing um, today, it, it's because we, we got off on the wrong foot. We got off on a point of conflict and we've never really recovered. Um, so thank you for that, Jay. Like we said, next week, we're going to continue on. And um, you know, for our listeners out there, you can tell, you know, for the past few episodes, we've been talking mostly about the United States history here. We're trying to branch out more into an international scene. It's going to involve the U S and the Chinese, but it's going to be much more of an international perspective. So we're, uh, we appreciate you listening during the, uh, the history of the U S, but we hope you enjoy this one as well. So please give us some feedback. We'd be interested to hear what, um, you know, in, you know, for our, um, listeners on the, the continent of Asia or Europe uh, or South America and Africa. Um, we have a few of those. If you want to, I'd be interested to hear what, uh, what you think and what you have learned or what your perspective is from the outside, from the outside, looking back at the U S and the Chinese, like what, what you view um, our relations um, to mean. So please, you know, engage us on social media. Jay and I are on Twitter. Uh, we need to be a little more active. I think, I think on social media, we've taken a bit of a hiatus. Uh, both of us also have uh, have lives outside of this. So sometimes it gets a little bit busy, but we'll try and re-engage with our listeners. We're on Instagram as well um, and Facebook. So feel free to engage us, send us a message, uh, or you can uh, interface directly with us on, uh, on Anchor. Um, that helps us. You can ask Q&A, you can message us directly, we, or you can support us on Patreon or through Anchor. Uh, we do appreciate this. This is ad-free. We want to keep it that way. So um, as always, thank you for listening. Give us a five-star rating. Uh, that definitely helps the algorithm. It gets the message out there. And thank you again for listening to The Ones of History. See you next week.